Hey everybody, welcome to another exciting episode of Coco and Dolls. I'm not Dolls. I'm not Coco. That was really loud. I'm not Coco. There we go. And I say it's exciting because we have a daily double for what? you today or a double. Le double de jour. Yeah, we're going to talk about not one but two series that we recently binged on Netflix. One, a recently released series and one from back in the winter that we recently discovered one night when we were trying to find something to watch and they both have strong female characters in common so misogynists they're both like you they're a strong female character exactly so misogynists you can turn this off right now so <laughs> the series that we're going to be talking about today are unbelievable a netflix series about <laughs> a series of rapes so frothy stuff and our second series is in the dark a CW series from back in April, I believe it was released. That's right. So why don't we start with the most recent release? Which would be unbelievable. Dalts. Why don't you give us a little Synopsis? Summary? Yes, a synopsis. Synopsis of unbelievable. So the series opens with a very difficult incident in which a woman is raped and then has... The uh, and then goes through the I guess the process as to what happens after you are raped is you get the police come and mm-hmm. it goes detail by detail as to what happens thereafter, and then the series unfolds from there. Uh, we see uh, police come in and examine the situation and investigate local police, and then we see uh, three years later another branch of police come in from a different part of the country, Colorado. And they have a different set of rapes that they're investigating. So the two stories are intertwined. And we find out why they are connected very early on. But that's the basic synopsis right there. Yeah, it was, what, an eight-episode series? Eight episodes, that's right. Yeah, so what did you uh, think? I thought it was great. (laughs) I thought it was great. I really liked the the performances were really good. The storyline was really good. The uh, sets were really good. The dialogue was smart and snappy Mm. um, and realistic. What I liked most about this was the fact that it's... So when generally, not always, but generally when rapes are portrayed in TV, it's... They're they're portrayed usually uh, in dramatic fashion, in horrifying fashion, yes. Um, But there's usually some nudity. There's usually some sort of... um, lack of respect for the victims right in this series it was it was dramatically the other way around it was Mm -hmm. very the the rapes were very uh subtle i don't know if that's the right word but the the, the filming was subtle of that so you didn't really see a lot of it you sort of more felt the terror Mm -hmm. they were all done in flashbacks the attacker was just briefly seen, mm-hmm. um, and not to spoil it, but the the way that re- it was respectfully done is so there was no nudity really to right. speak of of the women. Mm-hmm. But when the rapist spoiler is caught, he, you see it all. You see everything that the <laughs> rapist has. Uh-huh. This you... is a Netflix, not for uh, Grandma at eight o'clock on CBS. <laughs> Oh my God, I can't imagine your mom watching this. Right. Like with us. Holy cow. Yeah, so, the, so there was definitely a, a line drawn somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that uh, women were heavily involved in production, right. both the writing and directing of this, uh, of this series. And by the way, the two cop protagonists who end up cracking the case, spoiler alert, um, are both women. So there was a lot of... Uh, it, was, it was turning the... the if it's, I can say the rape genre uh, picture or, or series sort of on its end in terms of doing it from a woman's perspective, truly from a woman's perspective, not just the victim, but mm-hmm. also all the way around. So I, I was just really impressed with the way this was done. And now that I've told the whole story and given away all the juicy details, Coco, what did you think? Did we say that this is based on a true story? We did not. We did not. So this was based on the first episode focuses on the first rape which occurred in 2008 in the Seattle area. And then the rapes in Colorado occurred three years later in 2011. Right. These are based on a uh, ProPublica article that was written at some point in the past few months, uh, kind of detailing 
the treatment that the Seattle victim received, kind of transposing that against how the cops in Colorado handled their victims. The first episode of this is extremely difficult to watch. Very difficult Because to watch. It's, it's not only difficult because you feel for this poor girl having just been victimized very brutally, but then she's re-victimized by the police because they don't believe her story. Well, and re-victimized by the process too, because yeah. we it, very we don't see very much of the of the rape in the first episode. Right. Mm-hmm. But the the traumatic part to me was her going through all these examinations right. and then like the cold instruments. You hear the clicking uh-huh. of the cold instruments and all. You can and you imagine. hear the flash of the camera as they take the pictures right. of her body because somebody said that in a rape there are three crime scenes. There's like where the rape actually occurred, then there's the victim's body and the perp's body. So her body is a crime scene. So right. they're doing the forensic examination of it. And so yeah, so she's victimized by the attack itself, then she's victimized by the process because that's completely humiliating. Right. Even under the best of circumstances, me going into my gynecologist once a year is not a picnic. So I can't imagine <laughs> after I've been completely brutalized, you know, by a stranger breaking into my place and doing this to me, I don't want to go through that. Right. And then the police don't necessarily there are a couple of middle-aged guys who have been around for a while they've maybe not necessarily had any kind of training a very small place to where this on, attack occurred yeah on how to uh, deal with this sort of crime and the victims and the psychology of being a victim of this sort of crime so they are already not disposed to really sort of care about this anyways besides the fact that they're supposed to because it's their jobs and then unfortunately Uh, The victim, her name is Marie, one of her foster mothers calls the cops and is like, yeah, she isn't acting the way a victim should act, so I don't think it happened. I think she made it up. And from there, the cops basically close the case. They bring Marie in. They interrogate her as though she's a perp. Yeah. They close the case, and then they charge her with false reporting. So she actually has to go to court. She has to defend herself against... Yeah, she has to get a public defender because she's 18 years old. She's got a crummy... Minimum wage job. So the accusations are on her now, and she's suddenly a a potential criminal. And somehow this gets reported in the press. So the newspapers and her name comes out. So her housing situation, she ends up sitting in a room in a circle with all the other residents of her housing, and they're all calling her a liar and a slut, and they're saying that she betrayed them and they can't believe that she made this up. And because eventually she caves under police pressure and says like, okay, yeah, you're right. I made it up. I just want to get this over with. I never want to think about this again. And until she's hauled into court, no lawyers are present during any of this. Right. Exactly. So she was very much, you know, barely not a minor. Right. I I don't want to say, you know, barely legal, but barely not a minor Mm -hmm. 18 years old. And she's defending herself against these guys who are saying, no, no, you made this up. You can imagine the intimidation. She's already been through an emotional and physical ringer. Right. And then she gets into this uh, questioning room and is accused of, uh, or, or questioned as to why her, her story is inconsistent. Well, she was just attacked. Right. So that's and, probably why her story is inconsistent. And you know what? If you asked me like what I had for lunch yesterday, I'd probably tell you a couple different things because like, right. I don't freaking remember and I wasn't attacked. I'm just living my life every day. Like, Well, and also in that uh, ProPublica story that you shared with me uh, before the podcast, that this was based around is that there was a study done and the statistics show that in that particular police detachment, the uh, percentage of story, a percentage of attacks that were deemed false was something in the 10% range. I think it was one to five. No, in, in, in this particular detachment. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Was, was in the 10% range. Oh, okay. Meanwhile, the national, national average is, yeah. is 1% uh-huh. or 2%. It depends on right. where it is. So there was already a problem in this detachment saying, well, there's no way you were attacked. And mm-hmm. that was counter to national statistics. So there was a problem right from the get-go. Now, one of the things I wanted to mention is that it seems like, it, in the portrayal anyway is that everybody had the best intentions to start with. So the the cop, the, originally the first cop who came to investigate, took all her, her information and everything like that. Uh, the original, the constable who, who came in, he had good intentions. He was just kind of sitting there, uh, wanted to get the details down. But he was still... He wasn't being like, take your time. Right. You know, he right. wasn't being... 
he wasn't going the extra mile, but he was listening to her. I just, sorry to interrupt, but like you contrast what she went through in her police experience with the way the police in Colorado handed, right. handled the rapes by the same guy, Yeah, you know, and they were much more caring. It seemed like, you know, take your time. Do you need a tissue? Hey, why don't we get away from the crime scene? Why don't you sit yeah. in my car and I can take your but the, statement? The, the original yeah. stuff was set up to contrast that. So, right, exactly. So, you were, so what we were seeing in Washington State was the cop was originally, both cops, both the constable and the detective who came later, they both, you both, I got from the sense of them, they both were trying and they were trying to be professional or trying to be neutral to start with. Mm -hmm. And then that's when things spiral out of control right after that, when they started not believing her, especially the two detectives who were investigating the scene. And and then it went sideways. The, the foster mothers who got together and said, wait a minute, does this sound right to you? I think that they were, they had good intentions in terms of they were, they didn't want to, they didn't want the police department to waste energy and all that sort of stuff. But at the same time, this is your foster daughter. You would think that you would believe her first. And you know that she's troubled. You know that she's had a very troubled background. that Which included sexual assault. Yeah, which included sexual abuse. She bounced around to many foster homes during her young life. I mean, they said the reason why they went to the police and said, we don't think that this actually happened is because she wasn't behaving the way a victim should behave. But knowing we know what, now, though. Yeah, but what you know about her background and stuff, even if you think that she did make it up, wouldn't you be like, this is clearly a cry for help? This poor girl, like, she's making up this horrible thing for attention. Like, we need to help her mm -hmm. and not have the cops charge her with right. false reporting. Right. Well, that was bogus. Though. Yeah, I mean, and every other... Um, cop in the series when they were told that the Linwood PD, you know, charged her with false reporting, they were like, wow, I hope that works out for you. Like they were clearly <laughs> stunned. Well, and that, that never happened. happens too. That's one of those things that it's one of those charges like jaywalking. Right. I like, mean, not to marginalize this in, in this particular instance, but it's like hardly anybody ever gets charged. It's, it's sure it's breaking the law, mm -hmm. but there are other bigger fish to fry out there. Are you going to really charge somebody with false reporting? If they're doing it 17 times a day, right, exactly. they're calling 911 all the time, uh -huh. they're tying up resources, that sort of thing, then I understand that. But if it's one time only and there's a question of whether it's, it's not clear cut whether she did it or not or whether it happened or not, mm -hmm. then I don't think it, it – is warranted really. And the only reason her case got solved is because after the cops in Colorado took all this stuff seriously and did their jobs and, you know, found the perp and they went through his stuff, they found pictures of Marie Spoiler. <laughs> among his things and they they called the original detective in Seattle and said, Hey, we might just have solved a cold case for you. And he was like, no, 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 that girl made it up. And then he gets emailed the pictures from the crime scene. And I still hated him, but the the actor did such a great job. Like you could just see the mix of emotions on his face when the email came through and he mm -hmm. saw the picture and he realized, oh my God, she didn't make it up. She really was attacked. And I didn't believe this girl, and I charged her yeah. with false reporting, and her life has been ruined for the past however many years. Like, you could see horror, disbelief, guilt, shame, yeah. just yeah. the full range of horrifying emotions on his face. So he, I disliked him less than the other cop who handled Marie's case, but I well, mean, I still, still didn't feel... I, I felt bad for him, but I didn't feel bad for him, you know? I, I felt bad for him probably more than you did, but I was very uh, struck by his, by the actor's portrayal in that scene. Mm -hmm. As, as uh, avid and uh, dedicated listeners of the podcast will tell you, I am a very big fan of acting without words. So mm -hmm. if you can do that well, then you're, you're conveying a lot more than just words. And in that scene... There weren't a lot of words where he was struggling to come up with something and the facial expressions that he had uh -huh. were very dramatic. It was very telling in terms of what you could see in the actor's face. You could see the shame and the embarrassment and everything like that. And there's a lot of that in this particular series. There's a lot of acting mm -hmm. without words where there's two actors will exchange a look and the two detectives who are very good in this, um, they will look at each other and, and you know the lead detective will take a look and a second look 
and Tony Collette is the other. She will give an eye roll or what have you. So there's a lot of really good stuff, a lot of nuance in the performances in this. We haven't even talked about <laughs> the Colorado cops in this uh, in the show. Tony Collette and Merritt Weaver both did outstanding jobs. They, I think. Merritt Weaver should get nominated for an Emmy. Like Tony Collette great. probably will get nominated for an Emmy because she's yep. the bigger name. But they were both extremely like it was. I yeah, it was just really. Even though they were completely different, and even though apparently Tony Collette's the detective who she portrayed in real life is nothing like that character, right. so. You know, they clearly did that for, like, dynamic tension between her and Merritt Weaver's character to, you know, have there be a little bit of that. But they, yeah, I mean, it was just great. Yeah, the performances were outstanding by those two te- uh, actors. And the and the girl who played Marie, too. Right. She was, she, uh, she didn't have, she had a lot to say, but she didn't have a lot to say. She, she just, did a lot of acting without words. Yeah, she did a lot of acting without words. Like, there was a lot of crying, a lot of fidgeting, a lot of... Lip like, biting, and yeah. there was a lot of fiddling with fingers and things like right. that. Like but she not, did a very good physical job there. But not in the Kristen Stewart and the Twilight series way where... <laughs> I, that's a reference that goes right over my okay, head. Okay, awesome. <laughs> I'm sure that our listener will understand yeah. that one, but not yeah. I. No, it was it was great from... And yeah, from top to bottom, like all the supporting characters, the, the scripts were fantastic. I did appreciate that there was an effort made to cast diversity like people in bigger bodies yep. and racial yep. minorities although it was slightly cheesy that the racial minorities were all like asian and southeast asian people on the computer squad <laughs> in the cop shop but it didn't feel as ham-handedly stereotypical as the racial casting in in the dark which we will get to right but yeah that was one thing i wanted to mention too is that the characters in this are very real mm-hmm. so uh Merritt, who portrays one of the detectives uh, Merritt Weaver, I should say, um, very uh, disheveled appearance. Yeah, uh, hair wasn't always washed, uh-huh. um, and was somebody who you wanted to like, but had certain things that were resistant. So she stood a lot of the times with her arms crossed. Yeah, or which, her hands on her hips. Or hands on her hips, or yeah. or to the side if she mm-hmm. was talking to somebody, she would turn a little bit so her body language wasn't really open so these are real people kind of qualities the the women who were attacked you could tell that they were very um they weren't hollywood your typical hollywood types they were right. probably very close to representative of the people that an were attacked, average person or the people that were mm-hmm. attacked in right. the in the real story and and there was a lot of that and some a couple of the detectives the one detective who helped out with the squad with the rape squad uh the older woman who was you wouldn't say oh, yeah. uh-huh. she she was a bit of a uh, she was a helper on the side kind of thing, but she was not what you would call a typical sidekick kind of person in uh-huh. her appearance or demeanor. And I thought that was refreshing too. Right. So these feel these felt like real people. Other than Tony Collette, I didn't recognize anybody in this uh, series, which I thought was good because it gave it more. It's sort of like when Star Wars came out, uh-huh. and you didn't. I didn't recognize anybody in Star Wars. <laughs> so I, I, as a ten year old kid, I was like this must have really happened because there they are. I don't recognize anybody. And of course, it's that same idea when you have something like this when you don't recognize people. It's like, oh, there's, there's Tom Cruise as the, as the te- detective. It takes away. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, this is Hollywood. This is pretend. Where you have something like this where you don't know the actors as well, it feels more real. It feels more authentic. I will say that uh, the makeup team did Tony Collette dirty because yeah. the last, like, three episodes her makeup was horrible so i'm not a i don't know anything about yeah. makeup and, and even dogs know it i noticed that <laughs> I, I said at one point to to coco i said does she look over pancake to you because <laughs> yeah. her face and her neck were two different colors yeah it and was... I, it wasn't the tv no she's she's a very beautiful woman and i don't know why they were doing that to her right because nobody else on that show had that problem right. everybody else either looked like they were not wearing any makeup whatsoever or at least their face and their neck matched, which is how it should be. Well, so. and I know that it's nothing like uh, a national sports network where I used to work where the talent does their own makeup. It's nothing like that in Hollywood. <laughs> you get somebody to come in to do your own makeup. <laughs> right. So, I, uh, I, yeah, I I enjoyed it. I would totally give it an A. It, the first episode, extremely difficult it's to watch. It's a very difficult and watch, I've, yeah. And I've never been assaulted. So if it was hard for me to watch and you have been assaulted, 
take that knowledge into the first episode. Right. Be, and, be forewarned. Right, exactly. And there are other scenes of assault during the series, but they're, like Dalt said, like kind of shown in flashback. They're just kind of little bits and pieces. You don't see a prolonged like rape scene, yeah. basically. So Yeah, it's, it's, it's that old adage in Hollywood is that sometimes the things that are not seen are more horrifying than the things that are seen. And so I feel that way about this too, is that you, you see the flashes in the victim's eyes and you see mm-hmm. this and you see that and the, and the music plays up and everything like that, but you don't really see a lot of detail. Mm-hmm. And the, the scenes are very quick. The, the flashbacks are very quick and it gives it more gravity in my mind. And then when you're seeing the attacker stand there, buck naked, right. standing you know, and the camera is low and it's very dramatically lit and here's the guy out for, exposed for everybody to see it was very to me it was very obvious only after i thought about it for a while i was like hey wait a minute the only nudity in this show is is the is guy the who did it. yeah and uh it was it was very powerfully done i recommend this series it's it's an eight part series like we said but it's it's definitely worth the binge mm-hmm, definitely and i liked how they transposed like the attacker at the end the forensic exam he went through versus the forensic exam Marie went through right. in the very beginning. Right. Like you kind of bookended the show, even though his exam came with like an episode left because yeah. the final episode was basically Marie finally getting her happy ending. Right. Which, <laughs> Spoiler. Which, let me just say that, so we reviewed Ad Astra last weekend, and I said in that podcast review, which if you haven't listened to it, please go back and download it right now and check it out. One but, of few people who have not listened to that one. But I said... Ad Astra is not the sort of movie where you know for sure there's going to be a happy ending. Like, you don't know if Brad Pitt is actually going to survive or not, which I think is kind of rare because you always know that Brad Pitt's going to survive. I mean, come on. So, or at least you got is... the feeling that he would. Like, I think we could surmise that he was going to survive, but it's well, a matter okay, of... Okay, so let's not get off on that tangent. So anyways, <laughs> so we're not sure, you know, if... It's very rare to have a movie where you don't know if there's going to be a happy ending. This show, there shouldn't be a happy ending. But there is. And it actually Spoiler. happened in real life. Like, this is one example of the justice system taking way too long to work because that poor girl shouldn't have been put through what she was put through. But in the end, it all worked out. So that was... You know, normally I'd be like, oh, come on, seriously, you know, but like I was, even though I, you know, read the article that it was based on, like I was, I was happy. I'm like, what this poor girl went through, like she deserves well, and that everything just, she got. That you just know? shows you the power of the filmmaking is that it's a Hollywood ending, but it doesn't feel like a Hollywood ending. Like right, you, exactly. you recognize the fact that it's a Hollywood ending. Uh-huh. At the same time, you're like, I, that's, that feels good. Like that feels right. genuine. It feels authentic. Uh-huh. And you had read the real story before I, I waited until I watched the entire series and then I watched, I read the story. So I had going into that, I didn't know how it was going to end mm-hmm. and it still felt authentic to me. I, like I kind of knew that was coming, but I didn't know to what degree. I didn't know the level of detail, like what she did mm-hmm. and the results uh, at, in that last moment. So uh, not, I'm not going to spoil, I'm not going to be like Coco and spoil all the moments for you, but <laughs> there was, there was a couple of moments in the last episode that were choke up worthy for sure. Yeah, definitely. So unbelievable. We both recommend it. Gets thumbs up. Four thumbs up from Coco and Daltz. Four? Two for you, two for me. Oh, okay. Uh, you give it two thumbs up, right? I give it a four out of five. Okay. And I give it an A. So there we go. <laughs> so, so we what... got an A, a four, and thumbs all in the mix there. We're covering all our ratings bases. What we do not give four thumbs up to is in the dark. So, uh, you, you give the summary okay. for this one because so, I was too long winded in the last one. So in the dark is a 12, I believe episode series. Like I said, that premiered on the CW back in April. It's about a blind woman in Chicago who has, which is actually Toronto, which is actually Toronto, who has a friend who's a teenage drug dealer who gets killed. She stumbles across his body. Maybe gets killed. Maybe gets killed. She stumbles across his body and literally and the entire series is kind of her quest to discover his killer if he even died which is a question for several episodes so dolls what'd you think i i like the characters in this (laughs) uh the story seems like it's kind of rote you know it's like oh friend uh tries to find out how other friend died and and um that was fine that was 
that was a, the basic story. But the lead character, who is blind, is like a jerk. She <laughs> very is unlikable. Like probably one of the most aggressively unlikable characters yeah. I have ever seen on the big or small screen. Yeah. And I, so you said intentionally, and I understand that. But at the same time, if we we talked about this earlier, I feel like. All of the supporting characters in that show, they had their flaws, but they weren't written to aggressively highlight those flaws. Like they were still able to be real people, quote unquote, real people who, oh, whoops, (laughs) I cheated on my girlfriend. Like, you know, oh, whoops, I did this bad thing. Like, like anybody that you know would do and this lady just has a massive chip on her shoulder and she lashes out at everybody even the people who try to help her she if she weren't hot she would be completely alone (laughs) in life but because she's hot she can get away with treating people like utter dirt and if i didn't care about well i wonder who killed this kid i probably would have stopped watching it after three or four episodes well that was the beauty i thought of this episode of this series because i felt the same way and i didn't say you and i didn't talk about it for a, a while into the series, but I was thinking that same thing. It was like, I don't like this person at all. I don't no. like the lead character, the protagonist that I'm supposed to sympathize with and identify with in some ways. And the one redeeming thing that they gave to her, like the quest to find out who killed her friend, I kind of didn't buy it because I didn't buy right. her friendship. Well, the friendship, with this guy. yeah, the friendship was tough to buy. Because so she's probably mid to late twenties. And this kid who died is a teenager. He's in high school. He's a low-level drug dealer. He's like 13 or 14 or something like that. Yeah. And the whole reason that they know each other is because one night when she was like in an alley smoking a cigarette, somebody tried to mug her and they beat her up pretty bad. And this kid saved her and like took her to the hospital. And we're supposed to believe that from there, even though she treats everybody else in her life like utter crap. She loves this kid and they go out a lot and they hang out together and she's always happy and smiling and carefree around him. And I'm like, and these are in the flashbacks that we're seeing. Yeah. These are all in flashbacks. So I didn't, I didn't, even though I thought the um, young actor who portrayed this character was extremely likable. Oh yeah. He was good. Like I, I really loved him. So I really liked his character. Yeah. I I didn't buy the bond between the two characters. Right. No, like I could see how somebody would be charmed by him and want to be his friend, but I just didn't see how those two went together. I wonder almost if it would have been better to see more of him in alive in the current, in the present day, because he Uh dies very early on in the, or, or goes missing very early on in the series. And then we're searching for him. So because it's a 12 episode series, it might've been better to have him in more of it at the front end so that we get to know him a little bit better. Like maybe have him die at the end of episode one instead of the beginning. Or even in episode four or something like that. You know what I mean? Like it's a 12 episode series. And to me, there was a lot of, Oh, what are we going to do now? Like there was a lot of episodes in there where it didn't move the story Right. along for me it was uh-huh. kind of like just stalled it was mm-hmm. it was like oh well there's a romantic interlude here and let's go into that a little bit and and, and speaking of if uh the genders were flipped there and she were a man and her boyfriend were a woman everybody in the world would tell her boyfriend like this chick is an abuser she oh, is verbally yeah. and emotionally abusing you like you need to get away from her yeah like if she, she were a man, there would it would be completely clear cut. People would be like, "This guy is going to kill you because he's like full of rage, right. and he's horrible, and he's treating you badly." But because she's a woman and she's hot, he puts up with it. Well, and he gets and people, abused pretty good. Oh yeah, I mean, she flat out tells him, "You were the supposed to be the one who should have died instead of the person who did die." Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he already figured that out and feels horrible about it, and now you're like putting a guilt trip on him and I didn't I didn't really buy the way her character was written a lot like they not only made her just aggressively unlikable but like two or three episodes in speaking of her boyfriend like she's done all she can the first few episodes like she's not in a relationship she just goes to bars and picks guys up and has casual sex and then she gets her friend to identify hot guys in the bar. Right. And then she goes over to the guy and has eventually has sex with the guy based right. on that, but based then, on his looks. But then suddenly, like, you know, this this hot guy, she's like, I want to try to date you. And he's like, OK. And I'm like, is that how it works in the real world? Like, <laughs> I don't know that that's how it works. And then she spends like eight episodes. You've never him. been on a date before. <laughs> 
<laughs> never mind, never mind. Then she spends like eight episodes treating him like crap. And then right. at the very end, suddenly, you know, she decides there's another guy that she wants to date. And she's just suddenly like, I, j- I don't want to mess up a good thing. But I'm like, I... You've, you've spent like all this time treating people like dirt and saying you don't want relationships. <laughs> and I mean, I understand that people can change, but it just, well, it made, it, it basically the whole thing at the end with her saying she didn't want to mess a thing up. It was because she's they, messed everything else up. Well, because they had to further that plot line and get her and this guy alone so that right. what happens at the end can happen, which I'm trying not to spoil because well, there's a very much is a, holding up a knife. So. There's a very much a moonlighting kind of feel to it. And I don't know if anybody remembers moonlighting, but Bruce Willis and Sybil Shepard, who had the hots for each other, but never slept together. And so that was the dramatic tension all the way through the series. And then eventually when they got together, the series went downhill fast <laughs> after that because nobody was like, oh, well, they've slept together and let's move on. So it, there's always that kind of tension in, in a well-done romantic uh, connection like that. And so that's what we had in this series. We had these we had the lead character, the blind woman, and we had another character. And you could tell that there was magnetism there and they were attracted to one another along the way, certain ways. And then at the end, we get it. But it wasn't, it, it was a false ending to me. That was that was false. That part of it was false to me. Yeah, I... I, I didn't buy that. I bought that the male character you're talking about mm-hmm. did what he did. Yeah. Like, and I thought he did a very good job of portraying that, the right. actor. I thought he was great. I thought basically all of the... The puppy and, dog eyes and everything like that. And I, I should say, before I say what I'm about to say, that the lady who played the blind character, her name is Perry Matfeld, I believe. Right. I mean, she obviously did a really good job because I hate her character. So she <laughs> and did, she's also not blind in real life. And she's not blind and in real totally life. And you totally buy that she's blind in this. At least I did anyway. So so she did a good job of making me hate her character. But all the other actors in this show, I felt, did a really, really good job of playing flawed people who happen to be caught up in this situation that yeah. they don't really want to be in. Like the, um, I think her name is Brooke Markham. She played the blind lady's roommate who just enables her to a completely <laughs> horrible degree. She's the one who she eats on her girlfriend. Mm-hmm. I felt she did a good job. She was great. Yeah. The guy who played their boss, he did a good job. Felix, like, the character's in, name is Felix. In the beginning, he was like just really kind of annoying. But yep. then as the series went on. You got to know him a little bit better. You got to know him a little bit better. You and know his human side. Right. Yeah. Um, he the, was really good. I, he was my favorite character on that show. Yeah. the uh, There was a an, an cop who ended up being a dirty cop, but not like what you would think. She's dating a drug dealer, and she gives him a couple tips to make sure that he doesn't get busted. Like... I know you're not supposed to do that when you're a cop, but I felt like, I mean, if I knew that you were about to go buy a hundred grand worth of H and I could prevent you from doing that, I probably would. So thanks Coco. You bet. So I felt like all the, all the supporting cast I thought did a really good job. Um, It was just the one main character who was so completely horrible and it's coming back for a second season and I don't know how. That's going to work out. The, the connection to these two series that we saw, so In the Dark and Unbelievable, the two connections to me were the real people, were the portrayal of real flawed characters. So they weren't these perfect Hollywood people where, oh yeah, I'm going to do this and I go along and I do that all the way through and I'm dedicated and I don't have second guesses and uh-huh. I'm, I don't have any doubts and everybody supports me and I'm wonderful and I go from beginning to end and there, there's my story arc. Like that's not the way real life works. Right. And so that, that I thought in these two series, they were done, they were done very well and that you had these human flawed characters and these people that came across as people you might know or people you uh-huh. could imagine yourself being friends with mm-hmm. or working with or right. what have you. Mm-hmm. Except with the exception of that lead character, with the exception of... Uh, the blind lady in, in the dark is just, I, I couldn't imagine spending five minutes with her. Right, exactly. And these people all just take her crap right. and keep coming back for more. And we're supposed to spend 45 to 50 minutes with her an episode, you know, right. depending on how much she, she's in a lot of the each episodes. So uh, you're expected to spend quality time with her. And it's just, it was, it was really hard in some ways to, to keep doing that. But like you said, that was the beauty of this series to me was the fact that it has such an unlikable character mm-hmm. in the lead that 
I still wanted to know what happened. And right. maybe it's just because it's a mystery and that's human nature. It's like, well, there's an unsolved thing here. Uh-huh. How do we get to the end? Like maybe what we should have done is just watch the last episode. <laughs> watch the first and last episode first and, last and episode. skipped everything in between. Because all the other, <laughs> as, as, as it turns out in the middle was not, like I said, there was a couple episodes there. It was like, I didn't get anything out of that episode. Mm-hmm. Let's watch another one because I want to know if they're going to actually do something in the next episode. <laughs> it. I will say it took us like about two days to watch all of Unbelievable. And it took us probably about three weeks to watch all of <laughs> yes. In the Dark yes. because we would watch two or three episodes of In the Dark and then we wouldn't go back to it for about a week. And then we were like, all right, I guess we should watch another episode. So then we watch a couple episodes and then we wouldn't go back to it for a week. And so. I should also say too that In the Dark had some very good writing. It uh, did. The, the dialogue was very good. The, ban- yeah. the banter between characters was very good. Like when I was watching this, it, to me, I was like, okay, this is the CW. We found it on Netflix. But this is originally from the CW. It's like, this is where we are now in television. Is that we're even having these second-rate, third-rate shows. Like, who talks about In the Dark? Not anybody, really. (laughs) And Except us, I guess. But this show is really of high quality. I mean, the production values are really good. Uh The the scenes were really well shot. I mean, we saw a lot of... uh, Like, the the flashbacks were, were... in a certain colorized way. So it was Mm -hmm. obvious, but it didn't, they didn't hit you over the head with it, that it was a flashback. Like there was a lot of nuance and a lot of subtlety in the, and the dialogue. Some of the things that happened were unbelievable. Um, not to, right. Not to uh, to coin the phrase from the (laughs) other show, but uh, some of the things just didn't, I didn't believe, but for the most part, it wasn't like when you used to watch back in the day, a bad show, you knew it was a groaner from the beginning. Right. And you were turning it off. Like, it's like, <laughs> right. there's no way that happened. I'm out of here. Right. But nowadays, I think there's there's so much more pressure and there's so much more talent and there's so much so many more venues right. for talent to show mm-hmm. that we're seeing a lot of things that we wouldn't see otherwise, which is, in my mind, is great. Now, there's a lot of trash out there still, but because right. it's just more stuff. Uh-huh. So percentage-wise, you're going to see it. But in my mind, even though the lead character was not likable, it was still a worthwhile series. It was still... I don't regret having watched that. And the, and the blind character was... There were some insights there that somebody who wrote those episodes knew what it's like to be blind, whether they, they were blind themselves or they had relatives uh-huh. or had done a lot of really good research because yeah. there was a lot of... like But the tidbit about memories is that... I don't know if that was true or not, but that was a very interesting... And I won't spoil it, but a very interesting tidbit of the lead character has about memories and visualization and everything like that. So, so some of that stuff was really good. And it does make you think because at one point she tries to FaceTime her roommate because she's at like the bodega and she's trying to buy deodorant and she doesn't know if the deodorant that she picked up is the right one. And I'm like, wow, yeah, like all this stuff. That's real world stuff. Yeah, all this stuff you just take for granted, like buying deodorant at the corner store on, you know, on your way home from work or whatever. Well, it gives you a new appreciation for how visual everything is out there in today's uh world. And if you have a visual impairment, it must be a, a challenge. And, yeah. and it, I mean, so that it was a, I think on paper, it was a really good, like, here's a blind character who once had sight, by the way, and had, uh, I believe, macular degeneration yeah. at some point in her life, 15 or 16 or yeah, something like that. She lost her sight. As a so teenager. she lost her sight. So she had sight at one point. Um, to have that as a lead character take some guts, I think, by producers, writers, networks, that sort of thing. Um, and the concept was really good a murder, how are we going to solve it? It's just that, that, and again, not the actor. It was just the character, the way the yeah. character was written. It just was not, mm-hmm. didn't, it wasn't nice. I will say I also, I alluded to this when we were talking about Unbelievable. Like all the black characters in this show are like drug dealers. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, can you be? Well, and also like, a cop who's black but is, is a crooked, crooked cop. Because she's tipping off her boyfriend that... Who's a drug dealer. Who's a drug dealer that he's going to get busted when he goes to score some heroin, so... So let's play into all the worst stereotypes we can. Right, exactly. So I, I, I did appreciate that the roommate of the blind lady was in a bigger body... Um, I did, was also a lesbian. Who is also a lesbian. I did appreciate that one of their co-workers, Felix, was not a classically handsome Hollywood yes. leading man. Yeah, yeah. You know, kind of quirky looking, yeah. like probably not somebody the cheerleaders are going to look at, although apparently... He is well endowed, according to one scene. Well, at least in, according in the in the according show. To the, the show. lesbian who doesn't probably know any better. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I I and I I did appreciate that. It did seem like they really tried to capture daily life, 
Like it wasn't just like friends where we <laughs> allude to work, but we're all actually all just hanging out at Central Perk all the time. Like, right. I mean, they did do a lot of hanging out and they did do a lot of skipping out on work to go solve, you know, this kid's, you know, murder. But there was just a lot of, even though they were at the bar, it it just seemed like real. Like they're coming there after work and they're having like a party for this girl's birthday yep. and, you know. It, it just, it, it seemed like they did like a good job of capturing kind of everyday life and how people and not relate to monotonous. each other every day. Right, exactly. But the main character was just so unlikable. And it is coming back for a second season. Maybe that should be the name of this show. We got Unbelievable and Unlikable. Unlikable. I love it. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Dalton. Uh, so it they did uh, solve the mystery in season one, but now related. Spoiler. But now related to that mystery... Something is they've set up the storyline for season two, and I'm like, crap! Now we gotta watch this because no, I'm, we don't. I okay, I'll watch it. No, I'm I'm interested in seeing how they deal with it. It in it, so it involves money laundering. Put it this way. So I was out on Stranger Things season three. I'm still out on that, but uh-huh. I might watch it if you want to watch it. Uh-huh. Uh, but I'm, you're out on In the Dark season two. I'm, I'm out on the In the Dark. I don't need to see anything more of that character. And yeah. uh, Goliath is back for season three. Uh, oh, yeah. uh-huh. As of we're recording this, it's actually today is the first day. So I might go back to that just because I like Billy Bob Thornton in that story so much. Yeah. And the description of what I read about it uh, sounds interesting. It's not like there won't be any hacked up guys in this one, I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. It's no about, no wheelchair porn. So that's good. Right. It's about drought well, you in don't California. Have to, okay. You, we don't have to go into that. but <laughs> No, but I'm just saying that it depends. Like if they come back and and... There happens to be a development in in the dark that uh-huh. maybe there's a a change uh, in some way, you know. Right, like maybe the fact that, yeah, I don't know. I'm hoping that they figure out how to write her for season two because I I understand like she's had a crappy life too because she was adopted out of foster care right. and then as a teenager she lost her vision. So she's been dealt a bad hand in a different way than Marie of Unbelievable has been dealt a bad hand, but they both. They're both young, and they've gone through a lot of really hard things. So I understand having the chip on the shoulder, but it's just it, it was just so hard to get through every episode of her just treating everybody like dirt. And Well, and it felt false, like we said, that when you went into the flashbacks and she was all smiley happy with this guy that she hardly who, really knew. Who is apparently cutting school all over the place to go right. like take her to a lake to go swimming. In like, the dirty, suburb, dirty urban streets of Toronto and, slash Chicago. And then she laughs at him because he gets in the lake and forgets he has his iPhone in his pocket. So now his brand new iPhone is ruined. And I'm like, well, that's really nice. Thanks. Yeah. You know. So not a sympathetic character. character. Right. So what would you give In the Dark? In the Dark, I believe I gave a three out of five on CocoAndDalts.com. Okay. I did not review In the Dark for CocoAndDalts.com, but I'd give it a C. Yeah. That's about right. I think there are other things that I would watch if I were a listener right now. If I were a listener right now, I would (laughs) choose... uh, I would choose Unbelievable, obviously. If it came down to one or the other, I don't know why you would be comparing the two of them but unbelievable is definitely and it's eight it's eight uh episodes, eight episodes versus, versus 12. 12 yeah uh much more i mean there's heavy stuff in in unbelievable yeah. that's the thing it's not a very light show no whereas in the dark had some serious moments but was mainly light right uh-huh yeah i i agree so i think we should wrap it up now that we're at four hours for this podcast <laughs> Okay, why don't you do the honors? So, for another episode, thanks for joining us. I'm not Coco. And I'm not Dalton.